So let's pass the CVR adjustment. Much easier if you're on an automated system. And it is now doing the internal temperature compensation thing again, so it's going to be a while. Now, if a person wanted to, they could go, and you probably should for the greatest accuracy, you could use another banana connector and take those two straps off that are between the high and the low and the sensing posts. Then you'd run a second BNC cable down to, for example, a T, and then your BNC cables would come into either side of the T, so you'd be sensing the voltage right there because your sense, there's almost no voltage drop because it's not carrying any load, and you would get an even better voltage calibration. On some of the scopes, especially the 700s and the 500s, You'll be doing, you would be doing the voltage calibration on every one of these channels. You start out on channel 2, then you move to 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of change. And on this particular scope, it's a very simple procedure. You don't even have to be using your, your multimeter up there. Um, so this scope's a real easy one. Again, on some scopes, it's a much more of a hassle to, to even get through your voltage reference calibration. And in fact, if you do have to use the multimeter, if you have to do measurements, and so you're using the multimeter, you'll be using, instead of the sense there, you'll be using a BNC connector, your inputs on your multimeter. That'll come down to the very T that I was talking about. And so you'd have your voltage reference coming in one side, the multimeter looking at that voltage on the other side, and it would be helping the scope to determine what the correct adjustment is and how much error there is and verifying the settings. But with the 600 series, since it's not quite as accurate on the vertical scale, it, it doesn't quite need that level of accuracy. And this voltage reference, even single lead, is a very accurate voltage reference. And that's considered to be good enough with this scope. Okay, probe comp cal. Um, they give you a part number. Good luck finding that part number. I don't think you will, but um, you'll see that it's actually a very simple part. BNC, a couple of alligator clips. Um, make sure that your red lead or the non-grounded lead goes to your signal or um, it'll fail this. And I'll press the enter and we can watch what it does. Oh, shazam. And it tells you a little bit about what it's actually doing during this step. This is a pretty short little thing. On some versions of the software, you'll need to use the multimeter that I have here. Or you can get away with using your own multimeter. But you have to do a little bit of math to make it work. And um, that's kind of a... Sometimes you'll get the math wrong and it'll fail. Then you have to start over again. That sucks. Now it wants the voltage reference. And I think it passed. Yeah, it's going to high frequency cal now. Alright, now this is interesting. So now we're at high frequency cal. It's no longer going to be interested in the DMM, which it wasn't at all in this time, or the voltage reference. But we do need to leave them on in case it checks to see if they're there. I don't think it does, actually. You could probably turn them off at this point. It wouldn't make a difference. But um, we can see our frequency generator is set up scope seeing something and press the button and just like that it's giving you the signals that it expects to see you're not having to screw around with a little dial on your um, signal generators and a little scope mainframe not the scope but um, the mainframe that holds your SG504 and 505 and your PG506 which you don't generally need to use the PG506 with this. And so this is the way it goes for this part of the procedure. It's just going to be eventually it's going to tell me to move on to another channel. So long as it says it's passing up here I'm a happy camper. Up or right. I don't know if you can see it or not. I can't. But um, as long as it says passing everything's totally cool. When it stops telling you that it's passed and it says failing, then you might as well back up. You can interrupt the procedure with the F2 key 
back up, restart a section. Sometimes you just blow it and your setup's wrong, or you don't have a connector tied or something goofy. Um, but first time you calibrate a scope that's worth three or four thousand dollars and um, it's not working for you, your setup's not wrong, something's crashing. Um, believe me, by the end of the day, you'll be on pins and needles, and it, and it can take, especially if it's manual, it can take you six hours to do a calibration on something like this. Um, although if it's taken six hours, there's probably a problem. Once you get it down for a particular model, it's probably only going to take you a couple of hours. But you have to have the right stuff, and you have to figure out the software. If it's automated, it's a much steeper learning curve. I could never tell you what all's going on or how to set your stuff up on a video because, I mean, I had to take pages and pages of notes to get the hardware to work with the software. And that's kind of, I think, how tech likes it. All right, I'll let this thing proceed until something else interesting happens, and then I'll turn the camera back on. Sometimes when I'm doing interleave or, or tests that require that I... Um, have more than one channel getting signal off the signal generator. I'll break this little guy out. Uh, it works okay for interleave, but it doesn't work too well if you're like like calibrating a single channel. But um, it's basically a four-way um, power divider. I think that's what it was. A power divider. Then I got terminations on these. These are 12-volt relays, high-frequency relays. Good probably to like 18 gigahertz, something like that. And so basically what happens is, is um, no matter how many channels I have attached, it sees the same load here. A power divider typically expects on every input a specific resistance or it's not going to work. It's not going to do what it's supposed to do, which is even when we divide the power. Um, phase seems to be good enough with this for the scope. Um, so it just gives you a little design concept, pretty straightforward. Um, with some of the scopes you got, like if you're doing a one gigahertz scope, where I'm telling you it could take you six hours, eight hours, you might not even get through it. Um, your change in your Y leads to the various channels, all the combinations, you know, a thousand times during the course of the day, it's just insane how much you're doing it. One of the things that's nice about the automated system is that when it needs a different amplitude or a different frequency, it just simply does it. Whereas when you're doing the manual calibration, you'll get on-screen instructions, and you have to um, you have to um, find the correct setting on your equipment to give the signal it's asking for. And sometimes there's misunderstandings, especially as fatigue sets in. With this, it just simply um, tells it what it's looking for and it finds what it's looking for. Sometimes it's a literal setting, other times it's just an adjustment setting. It has to find a signal that meets the criterion that the software expects and it does that. So, I mean, you can see how many transitions are occurring. Well, if you're doing a manual system, every single one of those you'd be manually inputting. And so instead of what you've just seen in the last five or six seconds, or, you know, 15, 20 seconds, it would have easily this this amount of time would have been several minutes because you're making all these different frequency adjustments so it's pretty nice if you got a frequency generator that's automated with this but even still even if you don't have a fully automated system you could do manual key entry for much of this and it'd be a lot faster than trying to do um, using the old SG503 or the SG504 now the skew kills This is something you normally be doing with, uh, I think, the SG503. And, and this is a section where you can screw up pretty easy on it with an SG503. You, you end up adjusting it the wrong way and it never w quite works out. Like I think, well, maybe not there, but um, you try to get the, the, sine wave to the sine wave to transition from one state to another and um, Sometimes you just simply get the adjustment wrong and it fails. Then you have to start that section over. But this is a quick section, especially if it's automated. 
This is the SKU cal where you're doing multiple channels. You have to make sure that the two channels are active from your signal source with the splitter of T or like I'm using this little doohickey here. If you get lost, you can look at the trace colors and know that, like for example, the white trace is channel 1 and the green trace is channel 2, so it must be expecting channels 1 and 2. That don't always work, though sometimes it changes after the fact. So let's get it to do something and see what happens. See, it's adjusting skew. On a, on a TDS 700 ish class machine or 500 something, it does um, interleave. This is a much more drawn out procedure. Now it's telling me to go channel 1 and channel 3. So I turn off channel 2, go to 3, and then I tell it to go for it. Glitch trigger cal. Let's do what it says. Channel 1. I think this is a fast one. PNP latency cal. This is that one I was telling you about where you use this. G503 and, and it's real easy to screw up on and see how it flipped from one side to the other. You're doing that manually with the SG503 and sometimes it doesn't work out for you. Okay, I think this means victory. Um, let me flip that switch forward. I didn't see any fail come up on the screen. And so if I go shift utility, everything shows pass down there, so it looks like the scope is calibrated. Notice that a fair amount of time went by. So if you waited to the end and you saw this video all the way to the end, I'll give you a little tip. The reason why there's so much time passage is because I had a failure on channel 3, uh, 101 millivolt, 500 mega megahertz, it failed. And so what I did was I, I interrupted the procedure at that point ran, uh, and that was in the high frequency section, ran the signal path compensation routine and then redid the high frequency section and it passed. And that's just kind of a, one of those little tricks that there's no rule that says that if you're doing a long procedure you can't stop in the middle somewhere as long as you're not in between channels and um, run the signal path compensation. And, and what was going on is the room in my house is not temperature, con you know, it's not controlled like a lab would be. and um, because of that, it started getting hot in here, and I was wondering if that was going to be a problem, and sure sure enough, it was. It sure beats knowing that you can do that little SPC trick as opposed to having to take this thing apart, disassemble, get your um, acquisition board out and start screwing with it, when in reality it was just a calibration thing, probably a temperature drift in the room. I hope you enjoyed the video. I don't think... As far as do-it-yourself calibration system, you'll find a information like this anywhere else. So I hope you enjoyed it. Kind of proprietary stuff for me and my hobby.